we understand a little bit more now about why chemical reactions happen in the first place. But there is one thing that complicates our understanding, and that's the fact that all the reactions we've looked at so far start with reactants and end with products. Now that may seem like a pretty minor point, but in fact that's not always the case. Not all reactions actually end when they've made all their product possible. All of the reactions we've looked at so far have started with reactants, whether it's one molecule, two molecules, or more, and ended with products on the right-hand side of the chemical equation. And we've seen that there's a lot of variety in what the reactants and what the products can be. But we've always read these equations and these reactions from left to right as reactants that go forward to turn into products. And in fact, in nature, and very often in the human body, chemical reactions can actually run in both directions. You can start with reactants and end with products, but believe it or not, in many reactions, products can be chemically reacted in reverse to form the original reactants. We still refer to the chemicals on the left side as reactants and the ones on the right side as products, but now you can actually start or end in either place. And what complicates this is now we have to have a different understanding of what exactly will be contained in a reaction vessel if I do mix all the reactants together. In one way, it reminds me of those old Disney or Warner Brothers cartoons where one character was putting things into a box while another character standing behind him or her was taking things out of the same box. That's really what's happening in these chemical reactions. You have a forward reaction that's trying to make more product, but a reverse reaction that's unmaking the product right back into reactants. And what happens when you have this type of a scenario is that the forward and reverse reactions are really competing with each other. So if you think of that cartoon example, if one character works a lot faster than another character, the box might get very, very full, or it might get nearly empty. The same thing happens in chemical reactions. We call these type of reactions reversible reactions because they can move both forward and in the reverse. The aspect of this that's so important in the human body is that all reversible reactions reach their own equilibrium. And an equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean that the amounts are equal, but it means that the forward rate reaction and the reverse rate of reaction are equal. So in other words, every time a reactant turns into a product, a product has to go backwards into a reactant. Again, in the cartoon example, it's like the two characters are working at the exact same speed. But that equilibrium does not necessarily mean you have equal amounts. So there will be scenarios where you have a mix of reactants and products at equilibrium, and sometimes it might seem like you've got roughly equal amounts. But many other times, one side of the equation will be favored. So you might have more products than reactants, although not all products or you might have mostly reactants and only a little bit of products. And this is one of the important aspects of this biologically. It's within the human bloodstream, as well as many other areas of the human body, you have a lot of different chemical equilibria. In other words, chemical reactions that can occur both forward and backwards, but are always in a particular balance in the human body. Where that balance is actually has to be determined experimentally. So if we want to measure a reversible reaction in the lab to determine where the equilibrium is, meaning how much reactant and how much product is present at equilibrium, we would actually have to mix up the chemicals, let them sit for a while, and then come back and measure how much of everything we have. Same thing in the human body. When you're at equilibrium, or the chemicals in your bloodstream are at equilibrium, they've naturally reached a point where there's a balance between reactants and products. What that balance is depends on what chemical reaction we're talking about. When we do measure that information, we can actually use it to develop an important and really easy to understand constant that tells us about this information. And it's basically an expression that, much like many of the other calculations we've done this quarter, is actually going to just give us a simple answer that we can interpret to have some meaning about where the equilibrium is. The equilibrium expression is based on just a general reaction. 
In this general reaction, we have reactants A and B and products C and D. And you can adapt this for any chemical reaction, no matter how many reactants or products, just by adding additional letters. Notice that in front of each of the chemical species, for instance, in front of A, there's a lowercase a, and that denotes the stoichiometry, or the coefficient from the balanced equation. So the stoichiometry, or the balanced equation for these, is very important for determining an equilibrium position. The expression itself, or how you would actually calculate this, is simply a fraction that takes the products, puts them on the top of the fraction, and puts the reactants on the bottom. To calculate the equilibrium constant, you would plug your numbers into this expression. So notice that the stoichiometric coefficients turn into exponents in this expression. So that little a in front of the species a is now an exponent. So if you had had a 2 in front of the a, you would be squaring the a. And the numbers that we plug in here are in terms of concentration, usually in terms of moles per liter, which is a concentration unit we'll be seeing in Chapter 9. When you plug your numbers in here, it's important to realize that you're just getting some number out of this expression that gives us information about the mix of reactants and products. Think about it this way. Let's say you mixed A and B together in a beaker, you set it aside, you went out, you had a cup of coffee, you went home for the day, you come back, and you measure how much A is left, how much B is left, and how much C and D you've made. What about if you had roughly equal amounts of C, D, A, and B? In other words, maybe you made about half the products you could, and you still have about half the reactants remaining. Well, depending on your exact stoichiometry, we would expect that if the products, or the numerator in this expression, are about the same as the bottom, that's like taking one number and dividing it by a pretty similar number. And in that expression, you'd basically have a KEQ value, or an equilibrium constant, of about 1. In other words, your amounts of reactant and product are roughly equal. That can happen in chemical equilibria because you can have forward and reverse reactions that equal out when you have about the same amounts of reactants and products. There are also other scenarios. Imagine if you went ahead and mixed together your reactants, went and had a cup of coffee or went home, and you came back and measured your concentrations and found that you actually had pretty much all product. Imagine having mostly C and mostly D and very, very small or maybe even unmeasurable amounts of A and B. Well, in that case, our numerator, C and D, would be a really, really big number compared to our denominator. So when our numerator is really big and our denominator is really small, we expect to get a fairly large number. And in cases like this, your KEQ value is usually a large number, greater than 1,000 at the very least. And that means you have all products. So if you look up the KEQ value for a particular chemical reaction, it means that that chemical reaction, if the KEQ is greater than 1,000, actually makes pretty much all products. But if you look up the KEQ value and you get a number like 2 or 3, that's really close to 1. And that means you actually have almost as much reactant remaining as product. Of course, you can go through a full range of numbers here. If you're in between 1 and 1,000, you have more products than reactants. We would usually say that favors products. Anytime KEQ is greater than 1 but less than 1,000. And these are just rough estimates. On the other side, if you have all reactants when you mix things together, in other words, you basically haven't done anything or you don't have a reaction, we'd have a KEQ value that's less than 1 1,000th, or a very, very small number. And sometimes, especially in the human body, we'll see that when you mix two reactants together, you may not actually get much of a reaction, but you'll get just a little bit of product. In that case, we would say that it favors reactants. And the value we would expect to see is lower than 1, but maybe not as small as 1 1,000th. These equilibrium expressions are really just plug and chug calculations. Just be sure you remember to put your exponents in where it's relevant. Let's look at an example as to how to actually use the equilibrium expression. We'll start by writing the equilibrium expression for the following reaction.
This reaction shows two molecules of F2 gas reacting with one molecule of O2 gas. The product are two molecules of a gas with the chemical formula OF2. We already know that the general expression for the equilibrium constant shows the products in the numerator while the reactants appear in the denominator. Each different species is raised to an exponent and that exponent is whatever stoichiometric coefficient precedes it. In other words, the number in front. In this particular case, our equilibrium constant will have only one product. So it will only have one species in the numerator. Our product is OF2. So I start by writing the chemical formula for OF2. I need to look at whether I need to rate it, raise it to an exponent. In this case, the number 2 appears in front of OF2 in the chemical equation. So I'll raise this to the second power. Now let's look at my denominator. I have two chemical species that appear on the reactant side of this equation. One of them is F2, so I'll write that in brackets, and the other one is O2. You don't need to write anything between the two of these because there's an implied multiplication sign. But if you think you're likely to forget to multiply, go ahead and put one in. Now I need to be sure whether I need any exponents. In this case, there are two molecules of F2 gas for every one molecule of O2. That means I need to raise the F2 to the second power while the O2 doesn't need an exponent. In other words, there's an implied one that you can write in if you like. This is what we call the equilibrium expression. It simply shows the chemical species as well as the exponents that are pulled from the stoichiometric coefficients. If you were asked for the equilibrium expression, this is all you have to write. It gives chemists useful information about how valuable each individual species is in affecting the different equilibrium constants. Let's do this in a little bit more detail, though, by solving the equilibrium constant. So let's add this additional question. Solve this equilibrium constant if the following concentration values are measured at equilibrium. The concentration of fluorine, F2, is measured as 2.0 molar. The concentration of O2 is measured as 1.0 molar. And the concentration of OF2 is measured as 0.75 molar. Notice that the concentrations are measured in the unit of molarity. That's the only unit that we tend to use when doing these particular type of questions. So, to solve, I simply need to plug these numbers in and then chug through the math. For my equilibrium constant, we already know that OF2 is on the top. I can look at these values and note that OF2 has a concentration of 0.75 molar. So I'll take that concentration and I'll square it to get my numerator's value. In the denominator, I have two species, F2 and O2. The F2 has a concentration of 2.0 molar, and we already said we'd raise that to the second power. I'll multiply that by the concentration of the oxygen, which is 1.0 molar, and that's raised to essentially a power of 1. When I solve this equation, I'll get my equilibrium constant's value. In this case, 0.75 squared divided by 2.0 squared times 1 gives me a final answer of approximately 0.14. Why does this matter? Well, notice that 0.14 is a value that's less than 1, but not less than 1 one thousandth. In other words, I can say that this particular equation favors reactants. However, there are some products that form. That's how we use the equilibrium constant and a chemical equation to solve for the equilibrium expression or the value of the equilibrium constant. Now we get to talk about a very important principle which affects all reactions at equilibrium. This principle was named for a French scientist, Henri-Louis Le Chatelier, who was born in France in 1850. There's a lot of things to like about Mr. Le Chatelier, for starters, I'm a big fan of the mustache and glasses, but he also has an interesting background. His father was a chemist, and he was the type of chemist who worked in industry in the 1800s. He worked a lot in the mining industry and the railroad industry. This is where a lot of chemical research occurred. Henri knew from a young age that he also wanted to be a scientist, and he turned down lucrative positions in industry to go on to be an academic researcher and a professor at colleges and universities around Paris. He was a really smart guy, 
But having said that, he did live in an era where people could observe things that might seem obvious to us now and then get credit for them because they'd never been written down or more formally stated before. That's a little bit of what happened with Le Chatelier's principle. While he did very good, very rigorous research, which is where Le Chatelier's principle came from, the principle itself is actually pretty simple. Le Chatelier's principle essentially says, if you apply stress to any system, the system will shift to alleviate that stress. That applies to chemical systems, as we'll see, but in a more broad statement, this applies to pretty much any system you can imagine, whether it's a small beaker filled with a chemical reaction or whether it's the human body or an entire environment like the Earth. Le Chatelier's principle says if you apply stress to a system, meaning you do something or something occurs which throws the system out of balance, the system will respond in a way to restore its balance. How this applies to chemical reactions is when we have a reaction taking place, whether it's in a beaker or whether it's in the human body, if there's an established equilibrium, a balance between reactants and products, it's the nature of the system to keep that balance. If we apply stress to the system by heating it up or putting it under pressure or adding or removing some of the components that are necessary for the reaction, the system's equilibrium will shift to try to alleviate that stress. In other words, to try to restore balance. To look at Le Chatelier's principle in depth, let's choose one simple equation as an example. The equation and the reaction that I've chosen is one that's very important both biochemically and environmentally. It's the reaction of carbon dioxide gas and liquid water. Anytime CO2 and H2O are mixed together, a small amount of a compound with the chemical formula H2CO3 will form. This compound is called carbonic acid. So this reaction takes place whether we're talking about blowing bubbles into a cup of water or whether we're talking about rain falling through the atmosphere where CO2 is present. Furthermore, this reaction can take place in the human bloodstream. As you probably already know, your bodily metabolism produces carbon dioxide as a product. It's one of the reasons we exhale carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide, when it mixes with water, for instance, in your bloodstream, creates carbonic acid, which in turn changes the pH of your blood. In a very complex series of reactions that can be summed up by this simple equation, this is one way that your body regulates your respiration rate. Let's look at it in a little more detail by representing the carbon dioxide, water, and carbonic acid as actual molecules. We'll represent CO2 as small blue dots and H2O as dark blue dots. The carbonic acid can be green. Normally, when we read the stoichiometry of this reaction, we can see that for every one molecule of carbon dioxide and one molecule of water, you can theoretically make one, mo one molecule of carbonic acid. However, this reaction establishes an equilibrium, and the equilibrium constant, or the KEQ for this reaction, is much less than 1. Remember that equilibrium constants less than 1 mean the reaction favors reactants. What that means in this case is if you mix carbon dioxide and water together, you'll still have a lot of carbon dioxide and water and maybe just one or two molecules of carbonic acid, depending on the numbers you're using. How does Le Chatelier's principle affect this? Well, this equilibrium exists in the human body as well as in the environment. Every time carbon dioxide and water are mixed together, a very small amount of them will combine to, com to make carbonic acid. One of the ways you can stress any system, including the reaction between carbon dioxide and water, is by changing the concentrations of the species involved. So if I change the concentration of carbon dioxide by adding or removing it, or if I change the concentration of water or the carbonic acid, if I add or remove any one of these species, the system will go out of balance. It'll no longer be at equilibrium, and the system will have to shift in order to alleviate that stress, or in other words, to rebalance the system. We know already that when the system's at equilibrium, there are more molecules of carbon dioxide and water than there are of the carbonic acid. As an example of how we can apply a stress to the system, 
let's add some more molecules of carbon dioxide. Notice that when we add carbon dioxide, we're really just adding a reactant. We're essentially increasing the amount of material on the left side of the arrow. In all Le Chatelier's questions, think of the arrow as a dividing line. We consider the left side of that arrow the reactants and the right side of the arrow the products. In the case of adding CO2, I've added a reactant. I've essentially increased the amount of stuff on the left side of the arrow. By adding CO2, the system will now have to re-establish an equilibrium by shifting. When we say shift, it simply means will the reaction run forward or backwards to fix the problem you've just made. When we added CO2, we added a reactant. In order to re-establish equilibrium, the system will shift to the right. When we say it's going to shift to the right, we mean it'll use up some of the stuff on the left side of the arrow and make some of the stuff on the right side of the arrow. So when we added CO2, the system will reestablish an equilibrium by taking the CO2, reacting it with the H2O that's already present to make additional molecules of H2CO3. Anytime you add something on the left side of an equation, meaning you increase the concentration of any reactant, the equilibrium will shift to the right, and as a result, it'll increase the amount of product. This is one way that a system shifts to alleviate stress and reestablish an equilibrium. Let's look at some more examples. We just looked at the example of adding carbon dioxide, which shifts the system right and increases the amount of product. But what will happen if I add the product? That may sound a little strange, but for instance, in your bloodstream, there are other chemical processes that are going on that might increase the amount of acid in your blood. If I add H2CO3 to the system, I simply have to remember that H2CO3 is a product. So I've essentially just added a product. In other words, I've added something on the right side. In order to establish the equilibrium, or rather to re-establish the equilibrium, the system will have to use up some of that excess H2CO3, and it'll shift left in order to produce the things on the left side of the arrow. In other words, the H2CO3 will be broken back up into carbon dioxide and water, because when you add additional H2CO3, there's too much for an equilibrium to be established. So by taking some of it apart, we end up re-establishing the equilibrium. By adding product, the equilibrium will shift left. And as it does that, you'll end up creating more of everything on the reactant side of the arrow. So anytime you add something, we tend to shift away from it in order to use it up. But what happens if you remove something? For instance, in the human body, it's possible to become dehydrated, which would remove water from this particular equation. Removing water essentially has the opposite effect. It's a little bit like creating a hole, and the system needs to shift to fill in that hole. When I remove water, I remove a reactant because I can see that H2O is on the left side of the arrow. When I remove a reactant, the system actually has to shift to try to replace that reactant to fill in this metaphorical hole. As a result, the entire system will have to shift towards the side that has the thing removed. When I remove a reactant, the system will have to shift left towards the reactants, and as a result, it'll break up some of the products to replace the reactant that was removed. In general, you can always remember the following guideline. Whatever you add, whether it's a reactant or product, the equilibrium will shift to the other side of the arrow. So if I add, I always shift away in the other direction. If I remove something by lowering the concentration of any chemical species, the equilibrium will shift towards what I removed. So when I removed water, the equilibrium shifted towards the water. It shifted to the left. We only have to think about these equations as a left side and a right side of the arrow. In addition to applying stress to a system by increasing and decreasing the chemical species that are present, I can also stress a chemical system by changing the temperature, in other words, adding or removing heat. We saw in a previous lecture that heat, or energy, is just another species in an equation, 
because all reactions either require energy to take place or they give it off or release it when they take place. In order to make sense of this particular reaction, I have to have some information that tells me whether heat is given off or whether heat is absorbed during this reaction. That information is usually in the form of a delta H, an enthalpy value. For this particular process, the delta H is negative 19.4 kilojoules per mole. We saw previously that a negative value for delta H tells us that this is an exothermic reaction. And furthermore, we also know that exothermic reactions are the type that give off or release energy. Remember that exo means out of. Energy comes out of this reaction. So we can think of this heat or energy as just another product. To make it easy to understand how this will affect Le Chatelier's principle, I'm going to put the energy into the chemical equation so that I can see it whether it's on the left or right side. I put it on the right side because this is an exothermic reaction. If this process had a delta H of positive 19.4, I would have written the 19.4 on the left side of the arrow as a reactant. But because it's exothermic, I put it on the product side. Now that we know that, it's easy to predict how this reaction will shift to alleviate the stress of temperature changes. If I warm this system up, whether it's by placing this system in a beaker or whether we're talking about it as part of the human body's metabolism, warming the system essentially means I'm adding heat. When I add heat, I notice that heat itself is a chemical species on the product side of the reaction. So I apply the exact same logic we used previously when changing concentrations. Adding heat really means that I just added a product. And when I add a product, I have to shift away from what I add. So the result is this entire equilibrium will shift left and I'll create more of the reactants. The opposite would be true if I cooled the system. If I cool the system, I'm essentially removing heat. And when I remove heat, again, I can see that heat is located on the product side. There's 19.4 kilojoules of heat or energy every time this reaction takes place. So I've essentially just removed a product. And again, when I remove something, I shift towards what I removed. So in this case, I'll shift right. It's important to realize, and you should be taking notes right now, so put a big star in your notes, everything we just concluded about this reaction is only true for exothermic reactions. Think about how these conclusions would be different if it was an endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction, which would have had a positive value for the delta H, would have had that heat or energy value written on the reactant side. So if I warm a system that's an endothermic reaction, warming the system adds additional reactant and the system would actually shift right. So it's important to understand that which side the energy is considered to be on, whether it's the reactant side or the product side, is how we can conclude how the system will shift according to Le Chatelier's. One additional note of something to watch out for here is that over and over again I hear people say, well, if you warm the system up, you added heat, and so it must be a reactant because I added it. Remember that what matters is not where you think you're putting the energy, but rather where the delta H tells us the energy actually is. In other words, a reaction is endothermic or a reaction is exothermic, regardless of what you do to the reaction. I can take an exothermic reaction, like a match burning, and I can put it in an oven, so I'm applying more energy to it, but that doesn't make it an endothermic reaction. It's still exothermic by nature. In other words, just keep an eye on your delta H and remember that that tells you whether the heat is on the reactant or the product side. The final way I want to look at how a reaction's equilibrium can be stressed and how it responds is through changes in pressure. The first thing to realize is that pressure only affects molecules of gas. We'll be looking at this in a lot more detail in later sections, but for now realize that when I apply pressure to a gas, it affects the gas in ways that it won't affect a liquid or a solid. In this particular reaction, I do have molecules of gas. 
If you note that the gas is CO2 and it's a reactant, that means that the gas molecules are all on the left side of this equation. So on the left side of this equation, I have one molecule of gas. It happens to be CO2. On the right side of this equation, I have no gas molecules because I can see that when I look at my physical states, only one of them has a G. This means that when I apply pressure to the system, there will be a change because there is gas present. What will that change be? Well, the more pressure you add, the more you essentially are stressing out or applying stress to the side that has the most gas. So in this particular case, there's one molecule of gas on the reactant side. When I start to apply pressure to the system, that side will feel the squeeze of the pressure, so to speak. The product side, on the other hand, doesn't have any gas present, so it won't feel that stress. As a result, as I apply pressure to the system, the system will shift to the side that's feeling less stress. In this case, there are fewer moles or fewer molecules of gas on the product side. In fact, there's none at all. So in this case, when I increase the pressure, the system will shift right. That's only true for this equation. For any other equation, I would have to look at which gas molecules are present, if any, and how many are on each side. If I have an equation where no gas molecules are present, then increasing pressure or decreasing pressure will have no effect on the equilibrium. If I have more molecules of gas on the right side, the opposite would be true. Let's practice using Le Chatelier's principle on another simple chemical reaction. This particular reaction is something called the Haber process. And the Haber process refers to the reaction between one molecule of nitrogen gas and three molecules of hydrogen gas. When done under the right conditions, this produces two molecules of NH3 gas. It also is a reversible reaction. So when mixed together, these different chemical species create an equilibrium, or a balance of reactants and products. Let's apply Le Chatelier's principle here to understand how the equilibrium will shift when the following changes are made. What will happen if you increase the concentration of hydrogen gas? If you'd like, you can pause the video and see if you can figure out which way will the equilibrium shift. When the concentration of hydrogen gas is increased, we can look and see that hydrogen gas is simply a reactant. We know that adding or increasing the amount of a chemical species causes the equilibrium to shift away from that side of the reaction. Because hydrogen gas is a reactant, the shift will occur away from the reactants. In other words, the equilibrium will shift to the right, towards the products. The consequence of this is that we'll see an increase in the concentration of the ammonia gas because it's on the product side or on the right side. Let's do another one. What will happen if you increase the concentration of ammonia gas? When you increase the concentration of ammonia gas, ammonia, or NH3, is on the product side. To shift away from the product side, the equilibrium will have to shift towards the reactants, or shift left. The consequence of this is that you'll also increase the amount of nitrogen gas and the amount of hydrogen gas. What will happen if you increase the temperature? Well, in order to figure this one out, we have to have some more data. Specifically, we have to know what the delta H is for this particular reaction. The delta H, or the enthalpy change, of this reaction is negative 92 kilojoules per mole. Take a second and see if you can figure out which way the equilibrium of this reaction will shift when we increase the temperature. Because this reaction is exothermic, we know that because it has a negative delta H value, we know that heat, or energy, is really just a product of the reaction. That means that when I increase temperature, or increase the heat of the reaction, I'm actually just adding another product. Just like when adding any product, the result will be that the equilibrium will shift left. And just as we saw when we increase the concentration of ammonia, the consequence is you make more of everything on the reactant side. In this case, you'd make more nitrogen and more hydrogen gas. Finally, what would happen if you increase the pressure on this reaction? Take a second and see if you can decide. 
pressure changes only affect the amount of gas molecules in the reaction. And because of that, I have to look at which side of the reaction has more gas. First of all, this reaction does involve gas molecules. If it didn't, I would simply say there would be no change, no matter what I do to the pressure. But because there are gas molecules, and actually because they exist on both sides, I have to evaluate which side is going to feel the pressure more. On the left side of this reaction, I have one molecule of nitrogen gas and three molecules of hydrogen gas. So in total, I have four moles or four molecules of gas. On the product side, I have two molecules or two moles of ammonia gas. Increasing pressure always favors the side of the reaction that has fewer molecules of gas. In this equation, my product side has fewer molecules of gas. So increasing the pressure will shift my equilibrium towards the right side. The consequence of that is I'll make more NH3. If I had fewer molecules of gas on the reactant side, that's where the equilibrium would have shifted towards. This is how we use Le Chatelier's principle on even the most simple equations. And this particular equation, or this particular reaction, the Haber process, actually has some really interesting history. Even though the Haber process is a fairly simple chemical reaction, applying Le Chatelier's principle to it has ended up with global consequences. And the reason goes back to the man who's largely responsible for the Haber process, a scientist named Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber was working on this chemical reaction around 1909 when he realized that you could apply certain conditions to the reaction to shift its equilibrium as far right as possible. Why would you want to shift an equilibrium right? Well, in this case, the right side of the equation is NH3, or ammonia, and Fritz was trying to produce ammonia, for reasons we'll talk about in a second. By shifting the equilibrium right, it essentially makes as much ammonia as possible, which makes this equation give you more profitable and more productive results. So what Fritz Haber did is he applied his knowledge of Le Chatelier's principle to figure out what temperature and what pressure were best to do the reaction conditions in. For instance, he realized that not only did you want to mix a lot of nitrogen and a lot of hydrogen, you wanted to remove the ammonia as it was produced, because removing the product shifts the equilibrium right. It encourages the reaction to continue making more product. He realized that you wanted to do it at relatively low temperatures. Because this is an exothermic reaction, if you apply a lot of heat to it, applying heat shifts the reaction left, and that's counterproductive. So he did the reaction under relatively cool conditions, by industrial standards. As far as pressure goes, we just concluded that if you increase pressure, the equilibrium will shift right. And that's exactly what Fritz Haber concluded. By performing this reaction under high pressure conditions, he made it as productive as possible. He also figured out that there were certain catalysts that helped the reaction happen as effectively as possible. All in all, Fritz Haber was able to use Le Chatelier's principle and its associated thinking to figure out how to make ammonia in a very effective way. And for this, as well as his other contributions to chemistry, he won the Nobel Prize in 1918. Now, there's both an upside and a downside to this story. The upside to this story is that the reason some people, especially in modern times, make ammonia is because it's one of the primary ingredients in most fertilizers. Ammonia, as well as its associated compounds like the ammonium ion and urea, make up a large percentage of the fertilizer that's used every day around the world. And what does fertilizer get us? Well, simply, it can help us make more food on the same amount of crop land. So by applying fertilizer, a piece of land that might have fed just a family could now feed several more families. In part, this was responsible for the, the urbanization of our country, as people no longer had to work farms to survive. Some statisticians have looked at the numbers of production of ammonia through the Haber process and concluded that as much as one-third of the people that are alive today in the world might have fertilizer to thank because basically our food supplies wouldn't be effective enough to feed those people without it. So the good side, at least in a simple sense, to fertilizer is that it makes food, and the good side to the Haber process is it allows us to produce more fertilizer. 
There's unfortunately a very, very bad side to the story. Fritz Haber, as you might be able to guess from his name, was German, and he was working in 1909, shortly before the outbreak of World War I. His goal in working on the Haber process was not to produce ammonia for the sake of making fertilizer and food for the world's people. It was quite the opposite. His, pro his goal was to make ammonia for ammunitions. It's actually where we get the word ammunition from. And if you've ever wondered why some people like terrorists choose to use fertilizer bombs, it's because the chemicals that are involved in fertilizer are very similar to those that can be used in ammunitions. They're all based on ammonia. So the really bad side to the story is that Fritz Haber was actually working with the Germans. And there are some historians that believe that the World War I would have ended much earlier because the German side of the war would have run out of ammunitions much earlier on. Unfortunately, Fritz Haber was able to figure out how to make ammonia effectively and in that process create more ammunitions and prolong the war. Some people guess by as much as 12 months to 18 months. So that's one of the downsides to this. Also, you should know that Fritz Haber was a really interesting and a very sad character. He won the Nobel Prize in 1918, and to this day, it's one of the more controversial Nobel Prizes to ever be given. The reason is Fritz Haber is not totally as well known for the Haber process as he is for being the father of chemical warfare. This is the man who's largely responsible for the use of noxious and toxic gases during trench warfare in World War I. In fact, his wife was so upset by his role in this that she committed suicide with a service revolver upon learning that he had won the Nobel Prize. His Nobel Prize has been contested by many people, but his story gets sadder. We don't have time to go completely into it, but needless to say, he lived a complicated life. Even though he was a big proponent of his government during World War I, he was largely chased out of Germany before World War II. He died in exile. Much of his family struggled with his contributions to chemical warfare, and all in all, he lived a really sad life. But in the end, what's important to realize about this is he took a very simple chemical reaction, and he applied a very simple principle to it. The consequences of it had incredibly far-reaching effects. To say that one chemical reaction might be simultaneously responsible for one-third of the people who are alive on Earth today and simultaneously might have been responsible for extending a world war by more than a year is pretty epic for a chemical reaction that just has three species in it. Food for thought, and also a good place to stop for this particular section.